In the last video, we examined the hypothetico deductive method, which I think is uh, intuitively very appealing. It seems to match what most of us have in mind when we think about the scientific method. Um, uh, now, bear in mind that as I presented it, the point of the hypothetico deductive method is that it's a method of uh, confirmation. It tells us how observations can be used to confirm a theory, to increase our confidence in a theory. There are other uh, theories of confirmation. Naive inductivism was one of them. Uh, more recently, models have been developed based on uh, probability theory and so on. I'll probably come back to this later in the series. However, there are a couple of very general problems plaguing any theory of scientific confirmation. Uh, these are problems with the use of induction in general. Uh, today we're going to look at David Hume's arguments that induction is not rationally justified. If Hume is correct, we shouldn't rationally trust any ampliative inference, any inference where the conclusion tells us more than is contained in the premises. And this would seem to completely undermine uh, any theory of scientific confirmation. As we noted in the first video, science is ampliative. It goes beyond immediate observations uh, to give us knowledge about the world in general, or at least it seems, seems to, but Hume says this isn't possible. Uh, Hume's argument is very widely known in philosophy. Um, many of you watching this will probably be familiar with it. If so, you can skip this video. Um, this will just be a, a standard presentation of Hume's problem. Okay, so let's take uh, a simple inductive inference. Um, in the past, uh, whenever I've touched a flame, it's been hot, it burns. So I reason, well, all, all the fires I've observed in the past have been hot, therefore the next fire I observe will be hot. Um, there are you know, any number of other inferences we might make here. Uh, so you know, every past observed object has obeyed the laws of physics, therefore the next observed object will obey the laws of physics, and so on. Um, Hume's question is, how is this kind of inference justified? Why should the fact that all observed fires have been hot give us any reason at all to expect that the next fire we observe will be hot? We can generalise this problem. Induction uh, seems to involve a rule which tells us to you know, in infer from the premise all past Fs have been Gs right, to the conclusion the next F will be G. Um, you know, assuming that we've observed many Fs in a wide variety of conditions, this looks like a pretty reasonable argument. Uh, there's also a, a kind of probabilistic formulation, so where we infer from uh, most past Fs have been Gs to the next F will probably be G. Um, Hume's argument applies to both of these formulations. So, so Hume's question is, well, why should we think that this kind of inference is justified? Um, you know, the, the, this sort of inference of you know going beyond um, you know going beyond observed what what we've actually observed and, and and drawing conclusions about what hasn't been observed. Why should we think this is justified? Why should we think that applying this rule gives us any reason whatsoever to believe the conclusion? The argument against induction is simple. In principle, there are only two ways that we might justify a, a rule of inference. First, we might try to justify a rule uh, deductively. We might try to show that, uh, that the rule guarantees that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true also. But clearly, induction can't be justified deductively, or it wouldn't be ampliative. The fact that all past observed fires have been hot doesn't logically entail that the next fire will be hot. It's possible that the next one will be cold, that we just happen to have observed the hot ones, but there are actually cold ones out there. The belief that the next fire will be hot is a belief that goes beyond what has been demonstrated by experience, and that's something you can't get from deduction. The only other option is to justify it inductively. We might say, uh, well, induction has worked in the past, so uh, we can expect that induction will work in the future. The problem now is that this is obviously circular. It's question begging. It, it assumes what is to be proved. It assumes that induction is reliable and then tries to use induction to justify induction. So you know, the argument induction has been successful in the past, therefore induction will be successful tomorrow. Well, that's clearly an, an instance of, um, of the kind of inference, you know, most past Fs have been Gs, therefore the next F will probably be G. But, but this uh, kind of rule of inference. This is exactly what Hume has placed in question. Trying to 
uh, justify inductive inference by appealing to inductive inference is, as I say, it's clearly circular. So Hume says induction is unjustified. It's important to note that Hume is not saying that we can't be certain of conclusions reached by induction. Everybody knows that. At best, induction only tells you what will probably happen. It doesn't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Only deduction guarantees truth. What Hume is saying is that inductive arguments provide no reason whatsoever to believe their conclusions. There is no reason whatsoever to believe that since all fires in the past have burned me, uh, fire will continue to burn me in the future. There is no reason whatsoever to believe that because light has travelled at about, uh, what is it, 300,000 um, metres per second in the past, it will continue to travel at that speed in the future. There is no reason to think that induction is any better than guesswork. That's what Hume is saying. And we can drive home the point of Hume's argument by considering the uh, perhaps rather strange person who is a counter-inductivist. The rule of counter-induction basically tells you to draw the opposite conclusion to indu induction. So you infer from uh, all past f's have been g's right, to uh, the next f to be encountered will not be g. Um, so the inductivist makes, makes inferences like uh, every fire observed in the past has been hot, therefore the next fire observed will not be hot. Uh, and we can think of the problem of induction as being the question well, what would you say to a counter-inductivist to convince them to stop using this rule and to adopt the rule of induction instead? So suppose we object to the counter-inductivist and we say, well, look, induction is really useful, right? It's, it, it works. Counter-induction is a really crap rule. Because, you know, because I live by induction, I avoid putting my hand in fires. But you, the counter-inductivist, you don't, right? Uh, you keep getting burned by fires, and then you keep concluding that, oh, well, today is the day that fire is going to stop burning me. So you, you keep putting your hand in fires, and you keep getting burned. Counter-induction uh, has served you very badly. It's a miracle you're even still alive. It seems like a reasonable point, but the, the counter-inductivist objects. She says, well, you're just trying to justify induction by reasoning uh, induction has been successful in the past, therefore it will be successful in the future. That's just an application of the rule of induction. So why shouldn't I justify counter-induction by saying induction has been successful in the past, therefore it will not be successful in the future? Therefore, rationally, you should be a counter-inductivist. The point is that it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the, the, the counter-inductivist's justification of counter-induction looks just as good. Um, indeed, it's basically the same as our justification of induction. Um, you know, we're, we're just we're, we're using the rule that we already accept to try to justify the rule that we accept. Um, you know, so bo both arguments are actually quite bad. So it would seem. So it looks like we've got a, a, a pretty uh, you know pretty serious problem here uh, at the very foundations of our reasoning. Now, one way we might uh, think that this problem can be solved is by, by kind of adding an extra premise. And this is the, uh, the principle of the uniformity of nature. And this just says something along the lines of uh, the future will be like the past, or uh, nature is uniform, or something like that. You know, nature is regular and, and uniform. And we, and we do tend to think of you know, the world as exhibiting various uh, regularities and laws. So if we assume that the future will be like the past then in fact you know, we've got pretty good reason to infer from the fact that all observed fires have been hot to the conclusion that the next fire will be hot. If the future is like the past, if nature is uniform, then it looks like induction is actually rational, whereas counter-induction isn't, because counter-induction assumes that the future will not be like the past. But there are, uh, I think, two problems here. The first is, well, what exactly is the justification for the claim that the future will be like the past, right? What's the justification for this principle of uniformity? Well, there are two ways we might justify it. We might try to justify it deductively. 
but that looks like it isn't going to work. It's not a matter of logic that the future resembles the past, that nature is uniform. It's logically possible that the world is chaotic and there is very little uniformity. It's logically possible that all the regularities that have held up to now will suddenly change and things will just suddenly start being different. So it doesn't look like we're going to be able to give a deductive justification for the uniformity of nature. We can only justify it inductively. So, of course, you might argue, well, in the past, the future has been like the past, so we can assume that in the future, the future will continue to be like the past. But obviously, in the context of a sceptical attack on induction, that is, again, it's circular. We're arguing that induction is, you know, induction is justified on the grounds that the future will be like the past. But the only reason to believe the future will be like the past is because we've made an inductive generalisation on past experience. And, and that kind of inference is precisely what Hume is putting into question. Um, so again, think about the counter-inductivist. She says, well, uh, I can, can take the premise that the future will not be like, uh, not be like the past. Um, sorry, I can take the premise that the future will be like the past, that up to now, that nature has been uniform up to now, but that uniformity will suddenly cease. So, so, so she takes the same premise, right? She reasons, uh, in the past, the future has been like the past, but then gets a different conclusion, that in the future, the future will not be like the past. And this supports counter-induction rather than induction. You know, we've got exactly the same premise, but just applying a different rule. And uh, we, we get the conclusion the future will not be like the past. The second problem with the appeal to the uniformity of nature is that there are two ways of interpreting it. So on one interpretation, we're saying the future will resemble the past in every respect. Uh, if this were true, it, it would indeed validate inductive arguments. If the future is like the past in every respect, then, yeah, from the fact that all past fires have been hot, we can conclude that all future fires will be hot. But obviously, it, it, it isn't true, right? Things change over time. Dinosaurs once roamed the earth, but they don't anymore. So there are various respects in which the future does not resemble the past. The only plausible interpretation then is a weaker one, which says that the future will resemble the past in some ways. Nature is uniform to some extent. But arguably this really provides no basis for justifying induction. You know, let's pretend that somehow we could, we could show that this weaker version of the principle of uh, the uniformity of nature is is justified. So we 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 know that okay, the future will resemble the past to some extent. There are some uniformities in nature that we can expect to continue into the future. The question is, how do we determine whether something that seems to be a uniformity is in fact a genuine uniformity? Uh, Wesley Salmon gives the example that every election in the U.S. you can always find some precinct, say Maryland, that has always voted for the, the winning president, or has voted for the winning president the last 10 elections. Now, of course, we don't think that this pattern will continue. Right? It's, just, it's just chance. Uh, given enough precincts, you can be sure that a few of them uh, will have voted for the winner uh, the last 10 elections, just, just by chance. Similarly, a few of them will have voted for the loser the last 10 elections. Most you know, will we'll vote sometimes for the winner and sometimes for the loser, but just by chance you're going to get uh, this apparent regularity. So the point is that some apparent regularities, some apparent uniformities are actually spurious. Now, it's, now even if the claim that nature is uniform to some extent is true, it's entirely possible that all our inductive inferences have been based on apparent regularities, not real regularities, and so there's no reason to expect those regularities to continue. And so it seems then the problem of induction still stands, right? Even if we assume that uh, the future will be like the past to some extent, even if we assume that that principle is justified and we have good reason to believe it, that doesn't in itself solve the problem of induction. You've s still got a lot of work to do before you've presented a uh, compelling solution. If Hume is right, then uh, induction is irrational. Um, Hume's own view was that induction uh, is, is a kind of a custom or habit of the mind. Um, he, he, he gave a, a psychological explanation for why we use induction, but um, it isn't rationally justified. 
And, you know, that's a pretty uh, radical conclusion because science is, is built on induction. Uh, so if we accept Hume's view, it, it looks like we have to say that science doesn't have rational foundations. I'll consider a few possible responses. Uh, one response is just to say that, um, you know, this is all rather silly, right? Induction works. That's just obvious. It's obvious because science is enormously successful, you know, and scientists uh, get about uh, figuring out how the world works, uh, and they do a very good job of it. Um, you know, if, if philosophers have trouble justifying induction, well, it, you know, that's maybe a problem for philosophers, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the scientific method, um, you know, about how science works, which is what we're supposed to be interested in here. Uh, but I think that there is a genuine concern here about the foundations, the foundations of science. If science rests on induction, and if induction is not rationally justified, then we have to say that, that science is basically just a faith, not fundamentally different than you know any other faith. We can't treat science as superior to uh, uh, religion or ghost hunting or witchcraft or voodoo or any other uh, you know, belief system. Now that I think is a, a pretty unacceptable conclusion. Um, yeah, it, it may well be true that no working scientist cares about the problem of induction, which is fair enough. We, you know, we, we should expect working scientists to be focused on doing science, not philosophy of science. Um, but, you, you know, I mean, ignoring a problem doesn't make it go away, right? There is a, a problem here, I think, for the the foundations of science, and it's it's perhaps it's worth it's worth thinking about. Uh, a perhaps more interesting response, which uh, comes, for example, from Peter Strawson, is that actually the very idea of demanding a justification for induction is somehow confused or irrelevant um, or incoherent, rather. Basically, the claim is that uh, well, you know, we're asking whether using induction is reasonable or rational. Now what Strawson says is that inductive methods are simply part of the definition of uh, reasonable and uh, rational and justification and you know, words like that. To say that somebody's beliefs are reasonable or rational or justified, that means that they have employed good inductive inference. This is just a fact about the meaning of words, about our concepts. Our concept of rationality includes induction. So induction can't fail to be rational. Um, but to, to ask, is induction rationally justified? According to Strawson, that's kind of analogous to the question, is the law legal? What it means for something to be legal is that it's in accordance with the law. It's just nonsense to apply this to the law in general. Of course, we can ask of a specific law whether that law is in line with a more general body of law, um, like, I don't know, whether the, the law of some uh, particular uh, country is in line with international law or something like that. But to ask, is the law as a whole legal? Well, that's obvious nonsense. So similarly, uh, Strawson says that what it means for something to be rational is uh, that it conforms to the canons of deductive or inductive inference. So, of course, induction is, is justified. Of course, it's, it's rational. Um, in fact, it's, you know, it's, it's just a silly question to even, even raise this. Now, I think there are a couple of problems here. Um, first of all, uh, consider... So, so if I claim that induction will continue to be successful, well, it seems that that's contingently true. It's not necessarily true that induction will continue to be successful. Logically, it could turn out that induction starts failing. We can imagine a world in which things suddenly go crazy and all the regularities that we know of fail. We don't expect this to happen, but it's conceivable that it could happen. Now, in such a world, surely it would no longer be rational to use induction. Induction would no longer provide reliable beliefs. But if we're able to imagine a society, a, a scenario where we are perfectly rational, but where we don't use induction, then this shows that our use of induction isn't simply part of the meaning of the word rational. We can separate the concept of induction and the concept of rationality. So you know, Strawson's sort of trying to uh, kind of create a very strong tie between 
between the use of induction and rationality and, and perhaps we can actually break that tie. A second problem is that it looks like Strawson's manoeuvre could justify any uh, silly method of inference. In the Azande of North Central Africa, one of the primary methods of inference is the chicken oracle, where they ask a question and then poison a chicken, and whether the chicken lives or dies gives them the answer to that question. That's an important part of their practice of making inferences. So imagine an Azande person saying, well, is the chicken oracle rationally justified? Is this a good way of forming beliefs? It seems that Strawson would have to say that for the Azande, to ask, is the use of the chicken oracle rationally justified, is incoherent, because for their community, using chicken oracles is just what it means to be rational. Now, presumably, we, we don't want to say that rationality is uh, culturally relative to such a, an extreme extent, um, but you know, that's a, a, a problem there for Strawson's position. Another possible response is uh, a pragmatic justification of induction, which has been suggested by Hans Reichenbach. Reichenbach says, OK, maybe we can't justify induction through traditional arguments, but there's a good pragmatic reason to, to bet on induction, to keep using induction. Uh, so to uh, see Reichenbach's argument, we need to con contrast induction with any other method. So let's take guesswork. So I've got a little table here. We have induction and guesswork. And we can imagine two possible cases, right? In the first case, nature is, is uniform and has regularities uh, that we are able to exploit. Uh, and in the other case, nature is chaotic and there are no regularities. So let's suppose that nature is uniform. Well, in that case, induction will be uh, successful. It will be reliable and it will be able to get at some of the regularities. Guesswork, on the other hand, will fail. Uh, at least it will fail, you know, it, it will do no better than chance, because it's guesswork. Suppose that nature is not uniform. Well, then, yeah, induction will fail, but guesswork will fail as well. I mean, we know that guesswork will fail in, uh, in this case, because if guesswork w was reliable, let's, let's, let's suppose that in the case where nature is chaotic, guesswork is reliable, right? What would that mean? Well, it would mean that we derive correct conclusions from guesswork. Now, if guesswork gives us correct conclusions, that would actually be a regularity, that would be a uniformity that we could exploit inductively. If guesswork consistently gave correct predictions, we would continue using guesswork on the basis of induction. Induction would discover the reliability of guesswork. Basically, the point is that if any other method is successful, induction must be successful as well. If induction fails, all other methods fail. So, you know, by hypothesis, since we're imagining a world here where you know, nature is chaotic, where there are no regularities, uh, guesswork must fail. Um, it must also fail. So there's the, the, the pragmatic reason for continuing to use in induction. Uh, as Wesley Salmon puts it, he says, uh, we have everything to gain and nothing to lose by in adopting the inductive method, right? If nature is, if, is uniform, then induction works. Nothing else is going to work. If nature is just chaotic, then induction doesn't work, but nothing else works either. Uh, so, you know, it, if, we, if we adopt induction and it works, great. If we adopt induction and it fails, well, it's not really any matter because anything else we did would have failed as well. Now, I should say that, as stated, this argument is somewhat incomplete because, as we noted earlier, it's not so easy to spell out what's meant by the uniformity of nature. Nature is only uniform to some extent, and, you know, that, that poses problems for in, induction. Um, in fact, a, a particular problem for this is the worry that induction will latch on to apparent regularities rather than the real regularities. But I do think that Reichenbach's basic strategy kind of makes makes sense here. Um, the point is is that we, we either live in a world in which induction works or we live in a world in which induction doesn't work. Either way, we should bet on induction because you know, nothing else is, is going to work either. Um, so, you know, that's the, uh, the argument. Uh, one worry, of course, for this kind of justification is that it's it's not enough. Um, 
It's not simply that we want to justify our use of induction as a practical matter, we want to show that induction will in fact continue to be successful. Uh, we want to show that it is in fact a reliable guide to truth. And a, pra a pragmatic justification doesn't give you that. The pragmatic justification gives us no reason at all for thinking that conclusions uh, on the basis of induction are likely to be true. Reichenbach himself provides an analogy which illustrates this problem. Uh, so imagine a, a blind man lost in the wilderness who comes upon trail with his stick. He doesn't know where the trail will take him. Maybe it'll take him back into the wilderness, or uh, maybe it'll take him back into civilization. Maybe it will take him off the edge of a cliff. But the point is, is that his best chance of escaping the wilderness is to follow the trail. Um, that's, that's better than just you know, wandering around blind in the wilderness. He's found a trail, might as well follow it. That's the best chance he's got, even though he doesn't know whether it will take him closer to civilization or further away from civilization. So Reichenbach says that we're like blind men facing the future. Induction is the only path. It's the only hope. But we don't, we don't really know whether it will actually work. So, I mean, the point is, it may well be the case that it's the best option for the blind man to follow that path. But in, you know, in the case of the blind man, he has no reason whatsoever to think that he will actually get out of the wilderness rather than going further in. So are we really going to say that science, that all of the knowledge that we have built up, all of that's in the same position? Are we going to say that our expectations about the future based on science are no more likely to be true than the blind man's expectation that the path will lead him out of the wilderness? I mean, you know, this this seems more like just accepting that Hume was right than providing a solution. Um, so it's it's not clear whether this pragmatic justification actually solves the problem of induction or perhaps is, is really just a way of accepting uh, its force. Um, anyway, um, that's that's it. Uh, that's the problem of, of induction. And um, I will see you again soon. Thanks for watching.